Okay, so thank you very much um, uh, for the invitation. When I received the invitation, I was wondering whether they made a mistake and whether they were mixing up with somebody else because I have never worked in antifungal resistance. And I've, I do get a little bit of funding for, antibiot uh, funding for antibiotic resistance, but I've never worked in antifungal resistance. So I was wondering whether they made a mistake, so I wrote an email to uh, Dr. Agarwal and, and I said, are you sure you want me? Um, and he said, yeah, 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 we want you, and we want you to talk about, about stewardship and about antifungal and antibiotic resistance, or something like that, and the public health. Um, so I thought about this, and then I decided to change my title. Um, because I thought that if I'm going to be talking about antibiotic resistance, and that's honestly what I've been working on a lot, um, I might be getting red tomatoes thrown at me. And actually, when I met Jacques this morning, the first thing he said to me, Herman, you're not going to talk about antibiotic resistance, are you? <laughs> so no, Jacques, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I decided to change the talk a little bit. I will talk a bit about stewardship, but not that much. Um, but actually, we've done a global point prevalence survey um, some time back, and we also collected data on antifungal and, or antimycotic use. And I've never looked at that data, so I thought, well, that might be a good opportunity for me to look at it and to share the data with you. So it's never been published, it's never been presented. I only finished the analysis last night, um, <laughs> which drove Christine mad because she wanted my abstract, so that's why you don't have an abstract. Um, but anyway, I hope you will like the data, and I'll talk a bit about, about, uh, about stewardship. So there we go. But there's another reason why I think I made a good decision to not talk about antibiotic resistance or antibiotic stewardship, because there's a new guy now in the White House who has solved the problem of antibiotic resistance. Because with the old guy, with Obama in the White House, if you would click on the, on the website of the White House um, and you would type antibiotic resistance, you get a lot of documents about plans and Obama's initiatives, etc. And the, the next day after this inauguration, I again went back to the White House website, and that's what you get then. <laughs> so it basically says, it's very small, but it basically says, sorry, no results found antibiotic resistance. It's great, you'll love it. <laughs> so there we are, antibiotic resistance is solved. So let's focus now on antifungal resistance. You will be very happy, you'll love it. Are you a second now? So you should be very happy. So let's, fungus, let's look at anti, antifungal use. Um, all right, so a bit of introduction. I think you all know better than I do, because I've never worked on antifungal resistance, that um, <laughs> antifungal resistance is indeed emerging. There's lots of new antifungal or antimycotic drugs. There's actually very limited um, literature on antifungal use. Uh, I managed to read all the papers on the Eurostar this morning, so probably about 20 papers or so. There's no uh, global data on prescribing. Benchmarking, I think, is a great way uh, for stewardship and certainly also for antifungal stewardship, but there's, again, very few data on antifungal stewardship programs. All right, so this is what we did, a global point prevalence survey, and we had three aims. The first one was to look, and I'm specifically now, antimycotics and at the variation of antimycotic prescribing in hospitals. According to indication, uh, reasons for treatment in different age groups, to identify quality indicators and targets, and then to see, and that's specifically for my talk today, whether we see differences between antimycotic and antibiotic use. I also will look at antibiotic use, and as you can imagine, most of the data is antibi antibiotic use, but there's also quite a bit of data on antifungal use. So the overall method was to invite all hospitals in the world, they were all welcome to participate, um, to look at what kind of antimicrobials are used on one particular day of, or one particular moment of the day at 8 o'clock in the morning, and that they had to do between February and April. So, so you know, one particular moment of the day at 8 o'clock, you look at all your patients in the hospital and you look at what kind of antimicrobials they have been prescribed, including, of course, antifungal and antimycotic drugs. So we collected numerated data and denominated data. The numerated data were the patients receiving antimicrobial. The denominated data were the patients in the ward. 
And then the data we collected was on antimicrobial agents. We collected the dose, the number of doses per day, the route of administration, the indication of treatment, whether the reason for the, the indication was written down in the notes, whether it was guideline compliance, and whether there's a stop review date in the files. And then we also collected some basic information on the patients. And the whole system was a web-based um, uh, uh, entry system, and it was completely anonymous, and again, it was on a voluntary basis. Just this is the, uh, the, 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 the form that we use for the numerated data. Um, so you can, you can see, this is just an example for one patient. So you enter the ward, this is a hematology ward, the patient ID, uh, the patient age, three age groups, the weight and the gender, and then you have antimicrobial names, so you have the, the, the unit dose, the number of, uh, 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 the unit measurement, the number of doses per day, the route, then the diagnosis, and I'll show you the table, the type of indication, I'll show you the table, the reasons for notes, yes, no, compliance, yes, no, is stop review, yes, no, and then treatment empirical or targeted, and if it's a targeted treatment, they ask if it's for MRSA, MRS, uh, VRE, etc., and unfortunately, I have to say, no resistance for antifungal was included in the survey, maybe you should have done that. And then we also asked if they used, uh, if they tested the biomarker like CRP. So that's the information we collected. And this is then the diagnosis list with the different codes. I won't discuss them in detail, but that's basically uh, the codes that we use for the different diagnosis. And then this is the information we collected for type of indication. So was it a community-acquired infection or a hospital-acquired infection? And then for hospital-acquired infection, we had different categories like post-operative surgical side infection, etc. And then we asked if it's surgical prophylaxis, and then if it's for one dose, one day, more than one day, and then we asked for medical prophylaxis, and then some other. So this is basically the kind of information that we were collecting. We, the whole system was based on ATC classification. So we collected information on G01, these are the antibacterials, G02, these are, in, according to ATC classification, antimycotics, antifungals, the D01BA, and then we also collected information on antivirals, intestinal anti-infectives, TB drugs, nitroimidazole derivatives, and then antimalaria drugs, and we didn't collect any uh, information on topical use. So for the purpose of my talk today, we're going to focus on the antimycotic drugs. According to ATC classification, these are the antimycotic drugs. So you have M4B, you have the imidazoles, you have the tri triazoles, and then you have a few other drugs. So that's the information that we're going to be looking at uh, this morning. So first, some general overview slides on this 2015 global PPS. So we, we, we collected information for over 100,000 patients. Um, and of these over 100,000 patients, 35,000 roughly were treated with antimicrobials. So that's 34%, which represents close to 50,000 prescriptions, because you may have, of course, different prescriptions for one patient. So if it's combination therapy, that might be a different prescription. From those 34,000, 35,000 treated patients, 2,007 patients were treated with antimycotics, again the G02, which represents 5.8%. And that refers to 2,062 prescriptions, because most were on monotherapy. Very few had combination therapy, which is very different from antibiotics. And of those, indeed, uh, as I said, most of them had, had monotherapy. So roughly around 6% of all antimicrobials in the point preference survey were antimicrotic drugs. This is the degree of participation of, in the study. So we had hospitals from all over the world. We did have a lot of hospitals, I have to say, and that caused a little bit of a bias from Belgium. Also quite a number of hospitals from the UK. But then we have hospitals from many other parts of the world. And this is a, 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 the degree of participation by UN region. So 26% Western Europe, again, this is based on UN region. 26% huh? Western Europe, 19% Southern Europe. And then we had Southeast Asia, Northern Europe, North America, um, uh, West Central Asia, South America, Africa, etc., etc. Just to give you an idea. This is, I won't discuss in detail, but this is the, uh, the detailed um, um, this, uh, distribution of countries and hospitals and wards. For instance, for Northern Europe, we had 20, 30 hospitals participating for the UK. That represents 499 uh, uh, wards, which includes close to 10,000 beds. And you can see that for those UK hospitals, 33% were antibiotics and about 2% were anti-mycotic anti drugs. 
Okay. So and you have many other countries that were involved. And these are the other parts of the world. So you have, we had 15 uh, hospitals in the US, seven in Canada. Uh, we had quite a number of hospitals in Chile, and then other part, quite a number of hospitals also in, in the Mediterranean region. And there's more, but you can't see it on the slide. Just to give you an idea of the, the, uh, the representation. So let's look at the proportion of antimicrotic use by ward. Not surprisingly, mostly adult intensive care unit, uh, adult medical wards, adult surgical wards, and of course the hemato uh, onco transplant wards. That's where most of the antifungal, anti, sorry, antimicrotic drugs were used. Let's look at the AIDS distribution of patients on antimicrotics versus antibiotics. So um, 0 to 18 more proportionally on antimicrotics than anti, uh, antibiotics. And then the old, older, let's say above 75 years of age, more on antibiotics than antimicrotics. And in between, roughly the same, except the group between 46 and 64, where you have more antimicrotic drugs than antibiotic drugs. So let's look at more at the uh, antimicrotic use in these hospitals. This shows you the proportion of antimicrobials recorded in the global PPS, all antimicrobials, so all ATC uh, groups, and you can see obviously that around 90% of them represent antibiotics, and 4.2% represent the G02, the antimicrotics for systemic use. So which antimicrotics are these 4.2%? As you can imagine, most of them uh, fluconazole, around 60%, 11% voriconazole, 7% itraconazole, 7% amphobie, 5% caspofungin, um, around 5% mecafungin, posaconazole, and then, and then some others. But most of the, of the antimicrotic drugs were, were fluconazole. How were these administered? And then again, comparing this to antibiotics. Overall picture, so percentage of parenteral and oral antimicrotic treatments, only looking at parenteral and anti antimicrotics. Some were also used for inhalation, very few, but some were used for that. Um, that's why the, the, the norm is a bit different, but anyway. So close to 60% of all antimicrotic use in these hospitals worldwide were for oral treatment, and around roughly 40% were for parenteral treatment. If you compare this to antibiotics, so antibiotics on the right, antimicrotics on the left, so antibiotics around 30% oral, 70% parenteral. Again, for antimicrotics around 60% uh, oral and around, let's say, 40% roughly parenteral. So where were they used? Um, um, and according to the different drugs, and we, basically when you look at parenteral versus oral, you basically look, of course, at fluco and voriconazole. And, and, and so that's just the distribution. You can see for fluco, 63% oral and 36% parental. Voriconazole was 73% oral and 27% um, parental. The others are mostly parental, so I won't discuss them. Now, the interesting thing is to look at for each of these hospitals, and I only looked at the hospitals where you have at least 10 prescriptions, for each of these hospitals to look at the proportion of parenteral versus oral use. And that's quite interesting, because you can see as a hospital, when you do this kind of point of survey, where you are. And it's not because you might be, let's say, a bad or a good hospital in terms of proportion of parental and oral use, but it might help you to understand that maybe something is going right or going wrong in your hospital. Because you can see that, that if you look at the colors, so, all, so uh, um, red is oral, and, uh, and blue is parenteral, you can see huge variation. And in some hospitals, you have very little oral and a lot of parenteral. And in other hospitals, you have a lot of uh, parenteral and, and very little oral. So you can see, if you do that kind of point spread survey, where you are. And again, it might help you to you know, think about whether you do things right or wrong. And, and maybe this you know, helps you with your stewardship program. That is looking then at the parenteral and oral antimicrotic use by department. And uh, not surprisingly, I'll come back to this, you find more parental use in intensive care units, both adults and neonatal and pediatrics. And you find more in the adult medical uh, wards, uh, more oral use. Again, not surprising. So let's look at the indications for antimicrotic treatment. Overall, if you look at community, hospital, and then prophylaxis, medical surgical prophylaxis, you can see that 20% are for community-acquired infections, 30% for hospital-acquired infections, 
most of them, not surprisingly, are nearly half of them for medical prophylaxis and very, very little for surgical prophylaxis. If you look at the frequencies of diagnosis, again, mostly for medical prophylaxis, and then other, and others, this is really a mixture of many, many different diagnosis groups, less than 3%, so many, many different things. That represents around a quarter of, the, of, the, of all the patients treated with antimycotic drugs. And then lower respiratory tract infection, 9%, intradominal sepsis, 6%, ear nose, uh, ear nose throat, 5%, uh, neutropenic fever, 4%, etc. So mostly for medical prophylaxis. Interestingly, looking now at uh, quality indicators, um, and this is a busy slide, but it's looking at a number of quality indicators that we have identified in these point preference surveys. And I've done actually a lot of point preference surveys and developed this initially for antibiotics together with, with Peter Davy and with uh, Dilip in, in Dundee. So we did a lot of these point preference surveys many years back with, uh, with, uh, with Peter and with, uh, with Dilip. So these are the kind of uh, indicators that we had developed in that, at that time for antibiotics, but we also looked at them for antimycotic use. So looking at the reason in notes, guideline compliance, stop re review uh, date in the files, and whether it's parental or oral. And these are the different regions of or Northern Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, America, North, South, uh, Asia, uh, West, uh, uh, Central versus East, uh, South, and then New Zealand, uh, uh, Australia, and Africa. Not a lot of big differences. So overall, reason in notes was 70%. You find it lower in Asia, higher in some other countries. Um, guideline compliance, yes, around 70%. And again, with some variation, it was much less, for instance, in Africa. It was better in other countries. Stop review date, on, in, on average, is pretty low. It's around 30%, and it's, and it's also low in most other uh, parts of the world. And then you've seen the figures before for parenteral oral, and again, uh, you see some differences, but not less variation than for others. So looking now at the comparison of these quality indicators of antimycotic and antibiotic use. So now you have it in a, look, look in a different way. So you have your quality indicators to the left, reason and notes, guideline compliance, stop uh, review date in the notes, and whether it's parental versus oral left antimycotics, right antibiotics. If you look at the reason in notes, it was more frequently found for antibiotics than for antifungals. Guideline compliance was more frequently compliant with the guidelines for antimycotics than for antibiotics. And then stop review was low for, for both of them. And as you've already seen the figures for parental and oral use. So in conclusion, it's a very common, simple, uh, and uniform methodology uh, and, and, and a web-based tool for uh, data collection. So it's a very feasible and achievable system. Um, again, it's very simple, and I wanted to keep it very simple, particularly because I wanted to develop a tool more for low-middle-income countries, because we have done a lot of point reference surveys also through ECDC in Europe, and we have good tools, and US have done this later. But there's very little available for low middle income countries. And that's really why I wanted to develop such a tool to give them the opportunity to look at where they are, what they are prescribing in their hospital, because it's basically nothing for them to see where they are. And I can tell you that many of these hospitals had no idea what they were doing and what kind of antimicrobials, including antibiotics and antimicrobials, they were prescribing. And they were very happy to at least know where they are. So I was very pleased about that. It's, it has. Um, the software has um, checks that are built in the software, but you have to be aware of the fact that, for instance, we have no definition of disease. For instance, if you compare this ECDC point preference service, you have a, a telephone book, as, uh, let's say nearly as thick of it as a telephone book, with the definition of what is a cap and what is VAP and what is this and what is that. Here we accept whatever the diagnosis is. We just want to keep it simple. So if, if it's a cap, well then we accept that it's a cap, but maybe it wasn't, but we have no definition. We just accept the diagnosis. Um, it enables in-depth interpretation of, of antimicrobial prescribing at different levels, but you need to be aware of the fact that, of course, for antimicrotics, the numbers are much lower than for antibiotics. So that makes it a bit less reliable, much lower numbers. And for, of course, again, for children, for neonates, the numbers are also very low. 
What is great in terms of antibiotic stewardship, whether it's for antibiotics or antimycotics, is the local networking. It, I've seen many hospitals in the world where they've done poor prevent surveys, where they've never done this before, where they've never had any discussion before between people working in wards and in, in, and in pharmacies and in, in, in the labs, getting together and seeing how they were going to organize a poor prevent survey and then for the first time doing things together. So to me, that, I think that's great. It gives you instant feedback. So when I do surveys, I would want to do surveys that are for the benefit of the people who do surveys, because we do a lot of surveillance, collecting a lot of information, and very little is often done with that kind of information. That's not what I want. So what we built in the system is an immediate feedback. So when you enter the data, and the data validated, you get immediately figures that you can use for your PowerPoint slides. Um, it helps you to identify uh, targets for quality improvement, but again, there's no validation also of the recorded results. So the reasoning notes may have been too optimistic in some of the hospitals. That's, of course, something we cannot check. I, mean, I hope for themselves that they are honest with the way they're doing it, but there's no validation, so I need to take this into account. And then it's certainly a tool also for assessing interventions to improve prescribing, and actually point prevent service have been used in Scotland in, uh, to uh, improve prescribing for antibacterials very successfully, I should say. And BS BSEC is now developing a stewardship tool that should be ready by ECMI 2017 um, for these kind of uh, point preference surveys. So if any of you have participated in the point preference survey from UK Hospital, thank you very much for doing so. And what we're going to do next is another point preference survey. We've started uh, last month and we'll run this until 2017 and so any hospital is welcome to participate. So thank you very much.